Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, we're, the long talks are, are about 15 minutes long, and I will warn people at the 10 minute mark. So if you go for the whole 15 minutes, <coughs> there won't be time for questions. But if you end earlier, we will have a couple of questions after that. To get things started, I'd like to invite John Martin to come up. Cool. So let's do science. This is a, a little chat uh, about a citizen science project that we've got running about sulfur-crested cockatoos in the Sydney region. And who doesn't love The Simpsons? So, all right. Okay. All right. Uh, some of you, if not all of you, will be familiar with this species. It is the sulfur-crested cockatoo. It's a species that has uh, been identified as one of the winners with uh, our changes to the landscape, they're increasing in numbers and they're also happy to live in our urban environments, sharing the cities. Um, a hundred? A hundred's nothing. Okay, but so up front, just wanted to acknowledge that this is a collaborative project, uh, Sydney Uni, the museum, and uh, Digivol, and I'm at the Botanic Gardens in Sydney. So um, I'll talk to you about the Digivol aspect a little bit later. Okay, and first and foremost, apart from us who get paid to do this, we couldn't do any of it if it wasn't for all the Simpsons characters who report their sightings of these birds to us. So, you know, as with, with all the projects that a lot of us are talking about, it really relies on, obviously, the citizens. So, yeah, let's not forget about the people that are, um, are collecting the data. So, these are a charismatic species that people uh, regularly feed, whether you're pro or anti-feeding, that's a whole other discussion. Um, and we fitted birds with these plastic wing tags so that they're individually identifiable. And we did this with, um, we'd already been doing this with another species previously, the white ibis, and we thought, look, let's give it a go with the sulfur-crested cockatoos. Of course, our biggest concern was they have these uh, destructive beaks and that a plastic tag was not going to last very long. But uh, to our surprise, they've, they've lasted. Only a few birds have removed their tags. The majority haven't. And, and so with that basic sort of mark recapture methodology, we've got marked individuals that are identifiable. And we initially intended just to go out and do the surveys ourselves. But of course, these things have wings. And they were flying towards people and going to people's balconies and being fed. And so eventually, people asked, uh, started getting in touch with us to say, hey, I've seen this bird, which was a no-brainer. But I also have used this method with other birds, and people don't like Australian white ibis, so they don't report them. So you, you, we weren't sure. But, so one tip would be pick a charismatic species that's uh, going to already be um, well-known and well-liked. All right, so here's an example. Literally, they come and knock on people's windows, and you know we've got a lot of people in the community who have um, perhaps been feeding birds for years, and then suddenly they get in touch and say, hey, the bird that I've been feeding for years has just turned up. It's number one, or it's number 121. And, um, and of course, because we're... Um, I, I, well, one of my colleagues said, we should name them all. And I said, no way, we're scientists, we don't do that. But of course we name them all, and everyone loves <laughs> the names. So number one is Columbus. But, uh, um, you know, so in addition to people getting in touch with us, which was great, we then realised, all right, we need to actually engage with the citizens. So we got on social media, we had a lot of traditional media as well, and... You'd, look, I'm truly surprised that there's over 30,000 people following a Facebook page that just posts pictures of cockatoos. <laughs> and we literally just make silly comments. We, you know, as soon as we try to talk about the science, it's not engaging, it gets nothing. But, you know, the little, the pretty pictures, they work. But what it means is reach, because we're trying to contact people to say to them, report your sightings. And... So here's an example of some traditional media. Uh, the bird with uh, 027's name is actually Party Boy, which is why life's one big parte. Um, and so that was in the Sydney Morning Herald. And, and so, you know, we have been really lucky with the, the outreach that we've had that it, that it has been picked up by mainstream media. Um, 
you know, look, one of the challenges, of course, is we're in, this, we're in Sydney. Sydney's a big place, and this is actually a small project. Uh, I think it'd be a fantastic project in Canberra because <laughs> it's, uh, it's got a smaller population. It would, be, it would work really, really well. I think that would be a benefit. But, you know, you've got to think about these things with your design as well. Um, oh, that's unfortunate. All right. But the, um, everyone turn your head. And... Um, <laughs> We, uh, yeah, we checked it, but anyway. Hey, look, so the, the, the simple point here is you can get very close to these birds. As I already said, they are charismatic, and so I'm filming this on my phone. I'm less than a metre away from them both. They're behaving perfectly naturally, preening each other. And, you know, these sorts of interactions are really engaging. Uh, where I work at the Botanic Gardens in Sydney is right on the harbour, so, of course, we get a hell of a lot of tourists and also Australian tourists. Um, and a lot of people come there to see these birds, not necessarily for the wing tags, but just because it's a green space and it's an opportunity to engage with some native species. Um, a lot of us don't realise, because we're, those of us who are Australian here, you go to a lot of other cities around the world, you don't get these sorts of interactions in general. Some of the um, more tropical cities you might, but you, know, you, don't, you don't have a hell of a lot of parrots and things like this in most cities around the world. So it's a unique experience. All right, so then of course we wanted to engage, uh, allow people to report their sightings. And uh, the obvious thing is you get an app, you know. Who hasn't got an app for their project? Go on, put up your hand. Everyone's got a bloody app. Um, so... We, because um, you know the traditional methods like people can email you and all this sort of stuff. That's great, but it requires us to double hand all the data. So we've got an app. Initially, it was just on Apple, but it's now on Android as well. Um, that was always a bit of a nuisance to have it uh, not on both platforms. But it's really simple. Uh, you open the app. You have to register, but uh, you um, you just register within the app. You pick your species. We actually have three species that we've got marked with this method, and we're engaging people across the Sydney region to report their sightings. With the Australian white ibis, they actually move all over the country, so you can report them anywhere if you see them. Uh, you pick the colour of the tag. You enter the tag number. You can upload a photo. This is key for this point of the, uh, the next point of the talk. Is these photos is the key data I'll be talking about. Uh, it geolocates you. It tells you the bird's name, and you can, within the app, look at what other birds have been reported, the, most, uh, the 50 most recent sightings, uh, so you can scroll through that. And there are some people who are, as we, we've all probably experienced, who are very keen and report constantly and literally send me messages because they've checked the app and seen that someone's reported a bird and they're excited by this, and um, that's great. So... <laughs> So we built a website that allows people to go and query the data so they can search. So this is that one bird, um, and so this is all of its sightings since 2013. So this project's been going for a few years. It's got 340-odd uh, sightings. Now, as you can imagine, there's more than 340 days in the year, so arguably this is a very low reporting rate because you could actually have people seeing this bird every day, but it's hard to get people to report and to keep reporting. Um, these are urban birds. People would be seeing this bird every day. But a lot of people don't know about the project. They don't care to report these sorts of things. Uh, but anyway, then you can drill in and see in more uh, fine-scale data um, where, the, where the birds have is and all this sort of stuff. So there's that feedback mechanism. All right. Um, around the Sydney region, this is Sydney Harbour, we've had birds uh, only moving within about a 30-kilometre radius. Now, that blew my mind. Why on earth aren't they moving further? <laughs> And so you can see from the heat map there where the, the main red area is actually the Botanic Garden. That's where we've been catching and marking all the birds. So a lot of those birds aren't moving that far. They're only moving 5 and 10 k's away. Um, all right. But what we can then do with this data, and this is something that we are yet to, um, to publish, but is we've actually done a social network analysis. So we can see who hangs out with who and look at how that changes through space and time. Um, okay. So... That's just giving you the context of, of what we were doing with, that, um, with this project. The, the initial aim of this project was primary ecology. It's a native species. Most uh, people would assume we know a hell of a lot about the sulphur-crested cockatoo. It's common. It's, uh, it's everywhere. Um, we actually don't know everything about it. You know, we actually don't know how long they live in the wild. No one knows that. That's the first thing most people ask you. How long do they live? Do they mate with, with, with their partners forever? You know, the answer is generally no with those sorts of things. Um, we don't know that, that information. So, but what I'm going to talk to you today is specifically about the question, are cockatoos left-handed? So lefties do science, yes. 
Um, some of you may already know the answer to this. It is published in the literature. That's uh, 94. So there's two studies. Uh, Callum Brown at Macquarie Uni has done these studies. 94% um, of soft crested cockatoos and 96% were left-handed based on his two studies. The key point to highlight there is the first study was only five birds and there was 10 replicates for each bird. And then the second study was 20 birds and these are captive birds. So they're small samples. Um, one of the, just a generalization, all the large parrots, so you think about your carnabies, you think about yellowtail blacks, they're all actually left-handed. That's what his um, research has found. Um, the smaller parrots are generally uh, not handed or they're right-handed. Um, we can talk about that later. Anyway, so we've got uh, over 100 birds marked, but for this um, data we're focusing on 85 birds and there was 8,340 photos submitted through the app of those birds. And what we then, uh, this is an opportunistic study, we went, are they, um, are they uh, left-handed? Let's, let's have a look. We've got data. Let's see, let's, let's see what happens. Um, all right, so we worked with Digivol, which is great. Rhiannon's here in the front. You can work with her. Paul's in the back. It's really cool. Um, and what that meant was that data collected by citizen scientists was sorted by citizen scientists to assess this question. So that, I thought, was a nice little feature. So the, um, the project got loaded onto the Digivol platform. There was the 8,000-odd photos. Uh, we can see that 90 different people um, validated those photos. They all get secondary validation as well in the back end. And we got them to score about uh, 10 attributes of those photos. So were they being fed, the habitat, all these sorts of things. But right now, really succinctly, I'm just going to talk about whether or not they're left-handed or right-handed. Okay. And so then this is the, the devastating thing about uh, data, of course, is 8,340 photos, great. Not all of them show them using one hand or the other. So we had to get rid of 7,300 photos straight away. Um, they're useful for other things, but not for answering this question. We had to get rid of another 419 photos because we couldn't see if it, which bird it was. And of course, we're interested in individual birds and their repeat <laughs> behaviours. Uh, 145 photos, we couldn't see whether or not it was the right foot or the left foot. The photo wasn't clear. So now, and, but luckily there was an extra 51 photos that showed two birds. You can see that there, two birds in that photo. We can score them both as being left-handed. Left, um, so we've only got 509 photos. I wish we had a lot more. But anyway, that's what we got. Okay, so our data for those 85 birds, we have 45%. So you remember the previous studies were 96% were left-handed. So our data shows that there's only 45% of those birds were left-handed, 9% were only right-handed, and 46% actually used both. Now, the range of photos there is a key point. There's 6 to 22 photos. When we... Um, that's all right. Um, when, we, when we get rid of those birds that use both, because that was the method that Callum Brown used, they actually they said, oh, well, you can do a, a chi-squared test or an exact test for small numbers and say, okay, um, seven and three is significantly different, that bird's left-handed, or three and seven, that bird's right-handed. When you do it that way, we come out with 83% of birds were left-handed. So... Uh, when you look at those, those final numbers of saying, let's say we're generous and 83% of the cockatoos in our study were left-handed, we compare it to the previous studies, we actually have a significant difference. So um, whilst they are left-handed, they're not as left-handed as people think. Uh, but, you know, they do, like, they do generally uh, hold things with their left hand. So, yeah, uh, obviously working with these people um, was, is great, um, really useful to have Digivol involved. First and foremost, all the people who reported. And then, any questions? That's a mango that it's eating. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, as a, if the minimum we picked was six uh, replicates. I would rather it was much more, but uh, you know, you got to work with what you got. Yeah. And so, but if you've got six and zero, that's significant. You got six and uh, five and one, that's significant. If you got four and two, it's not significant. So.